Ah, the 2020s. What a fucking decade, right? I mean, fuck, we may not even be done with the first year yet, but you know what? Let's recap. Before we were even done with 2019, a coup in Bolivia overthrew the existing social democratic government of Evo Morales, replacing it with a viciously racist and authoritarian police state. Then as the new year had barely had time to poke its nose out of the womb of 2019, the United States had assassinated Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, and very nearly cast the world into yet another devastating war. Then in May, a band of American mercenaries speedboated their way onto Venezuelan shores in an ill-fated attempt to capture President Nicolas Maduro. Not to mention all the other stuff, like Australia being set alight by unprecedented bushfires, the ongoing pandemic currently sweeping the globe and potentially threatening millions of lives, or the nation-shattering mass protests sweeping across the United States over the police murder of George Floyd. Oh, and then the US caught on fire too. Lots of fire this year. Wonder why that could be. And in the midst of all this assorted worldwide environmental and political turmoil, another different kind of unspeakable thing happened. A new Half-Life game came out. You know, the funny thing is, I've had plans to make a video comparing the world of the Half-Life franchise to features of real-world capitalism and imperialism since way before any of this even happened. I was actually in the process of using what little free time I had between shifts at my last 9 to 5, slowly playing my way through each of the four currently existing mainline Half-Life games, just to get ready to make such a video. When I started, I honestly thought I was making something completely irrelevant, using a dead game franchise to talk about international politics at a time when public discussion of both was at a relative down point. A, a digital fart in the wind, if you will. But I guess things don't stay quiet for long, do they? In the words of Vladimir Lenin, there are decades where we fuck around and weeks where we find out. The new Half-Life game thing though, that was a genuine surprise. Half-Life is the name of a series of science fiction first-person shooter games that, up until fairly recently, I honestly thought I'd seen the last of. The first Half-Life game first hit nerds computers in 1998, when I was just a wee babby, and was widely considered a revolutionary milestone in the history of gaming, particularly in using video games to tell stories. At this point, Half-Life's predecessors, games like Doom and Quake, had a tendency to focus on action and not so much on narrative. What made Half-Life special at the time was the fact that it didn't hit pause on the action to tell you its story. The action and the narrative of the game were deeply interweaved. Computer Gaming World's review of the game in 1999 described it as an interactive movie, citing the fact that the game didn't divide itself into self-contained levels or break its flow with pre-rendered cutscenes, as was the case with the majority of similar games at the time. Instead, Half-Life tells its story through the gameplay itself. The classic storytelling rule of show don't tell comes into play beautifully, with new different enemies demonstrating their particular dangers on NPCs before you have to confront them yourself, and with exposition taking place in the form of scenes which you watch play out in the game world. Half-Life 2 took the principles which made Half-Life storytelling so notable even further, with more complex interactions with NPCs, choreographed scenes, and complex facial animation. Of course, all the effort in the world would have gone to waste if the game didn't have a world worth building or a story worth telling. And most of the critical responses to the game agreed, Valve definitely succeeded in both these regards. But to take it a step further, I feel like there's an aspect of Half-Life 2's story that it's not been given enough credit for. The fact that the world shown in Half-Life 2 has a lot more to tell us about the one we live in than you might think. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and do what's called a pro gamer move. I'm gonna take a beloved classic video game series from the cherished days of youth of many a gamer and make it political. Yes, that's right, just because I can. You'll be yearning for the days of tropes against women on all your little subreddits when I'm done with you. The Half-Life games follow strapping 27-year-old theoretical physicist Gordon Freeman, who works and lives in the Black Mesa Research Facility in the desert of New Mexico. Early on in the first game, an experiment gone wrong tears open an interdimensional portal, kicking off an alien invasion of Earth by the inhabitants of Zen, a kind of topsy-turvy world between worlds. 
The aliens of Zen form something of an advanced slave society, made up of several different species and possessing advanced technology such as teleportation and healing chambers. The Vortigaunts, also referred to as alien slaves, carry out work in Zen factories as the alien controllers or Zen masters, which seem to make up the ruling class of Zen society, oversee them. The leader of the Zen Masters and the mastermind behind the invasion of Earth is the Nihilanth, a gigantic levitating eldritch horror which is able to use its immense power to hold open the rift between Zen and Earth. The Zenian invaders are one of the two enemy factions you need to fight in Half-Life, the other one being none other than the United States military. <laughs> Half-Life, completely apolitically of course, casts the brave American troops as a gang of vicious mercenaries sent in by good old Uncle Sam to cover up the ongoing catastrophe by any means necessary, not shying away of course from brutally slaughtering unarmed civilians. After fighting your way through the Black Mesa facility, gunning down aliens and American patriots as you go, you eventually meet up with a team of scientists who develop a plan to teleport you to Zen in order to confront and ultimately kill the Nihilanth. The game reaches its climax with you doing just this, closing the dimensional rift and ending the invasion, before being placed into a kind of temporal stasis by the G-Man, an interdimensional bureaucrat of ambiguous motivation taking the form of a man in a suit. The first Half-Life, while seemingly lighter on political themes than its sequels, ultimately tells a story of the lethal negligence of the military-industrial complex and a government willing to do whatever it takes to maintain the status quo, including the mass murder of innocent people. Half-Life 2, which begins with Gordon being awakened from his stasis and takes place roughly 20 years after the end of the first game, shows us a future Earth forever changed by its events. Rather unfortunately for humanity, the aliens of Zen weren't the only interdimensional invaders with their eyes set on the blue planet. In Half-Life 2, it's revealed that the Nihilanth and its cohorts were driven to Zen from their original homeworld by an interdimensional empire called the Combine. The Combine, bent on conquering as many worlds as possible, leapt on the chance to add Earth to their collection of colonies, and the dimensional opening formed by the Black Mesa incident gave them exactly the opportunity they needed. The Combine quickly took advantage of the situation and used their vastly superior war machine to wipe out the combined efforts of Earth's nations within just seven hours of arrival in an event referred to by the characters in the game as the Seven Hour War. The administrator of Black Mesa, Wallace Breen, by circumstance of what are implied to be very shady dealings, is placed in charge of Earth by the Combine and essentially made dictator or administrator of the entire planet. Breen goes on to rule Earth in the interests of the Combine at the extreme expense of his own people, subjecting them to poor living conditions at best and brutality, mutilation, torture and death at worst. Dang, that's pretty fucking awful, right? Damn, it's a good thing nothing that messed up would happen in the real world where we're ruled by other human beings and not by malicious interdimensional aliens. Well, you see where I'm going with this. No, 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 stop, stop, stop. You're misunderstanding me. We are not ruled by malicious interdimensional aliens. Probably. What I'm actually going to be doing in this video is arguing that the basic formula used by the Combine to seize power and subjugate Earth's population is indeed not just the domain of fiction. In fact, the strategy of neutralizing resistance by shock and awe, installing a puppet dictator, and subjugating an economy and population is actually a longtime favorite of everyone's favorite capitalist nation state. The one true land of the free, the good old US of A. Before we get into all that though, I'd like to tell you a fun little story. Let me introduce you to Stuart and Linda Resnick. Stuart and Linda are the fabulously wealthy owners of The Wonderful Company, who are apparently responsible for delicious mineral waters and wines, tasty mandarins, grapes and pomegranates, and environmentally friendly pesticides. They also happen to be responsible for engineering the privatization of California's Kern Water Bank, to the great detriment of everyone else in California, particularly throughout the state's worst drought on record from 2011 to 2017. The Resnicks also, for some reason, seem to have a bit of a problem with Iran. What makes me say that? 
Well, the Resnicks are major contributors to multiple American think tanks dedicated to furthering the interests of United States capitalists in the Middle East. Particularly notable is the Washington Institute of Near East Policy, or WINEP, a key lobbyist in favor of increased sanctions and aggression against Iran. Here's a particularly telling clip from WINEP executive Patrick Clawson. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into the World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall he had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. Uh, but I would just like to suggest that uh, uh, one can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? <laughs> we can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, it, it's, this, this is not a, a either or proposition of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. Hey, what if we deliberately provoked a foreign country into starting a war with the potential to kill millions of people just so a few of us could make a bit more money? <laughs> just kidding. Unless... Mr. Clawson is being particularly candid here about what he and his organization are actually about, and his little ramble can actually tell us a lot about the nature of war under capitalism. Pro-war lobby groups like WINEP represent the interests of those American capitalists who have a vested financial interest in escalating tensions with other nations. The point when wars finally break out isn't when Uncle Sam decides that off somewhere there's some freedom that needs protecting. It's when there's enough of a consensus within the capitalist class that a war would be in their financial interest. All it takes after that is a trigger event that the government can use as a pretense to finally bring those blood-soaked ruling class fantasies into reality, as well as an ongoing effort by the media to drum up support for such a war in the meantime. But what interest does the wonderful company have in a war with Iran, you might ask? Well, the answer might come as a bit of a surprise. As a matter of fact, it's nuts. No, literally, nuts. The kind you eat. Specifically, pistachios. The Wonderful Company is also the owner of Wonderful Pistachios and Almonds, which is the world's largest grower and producer of pistachio and almond nuts. The USA didn't always have much of a pistachio business going on. Throughout the 1970s, the vast, vast majority of pistachios consumed in the States were imported from Iran. The year that opened the way for this to change was 1979. The Iran hostage crisis saw a group of American diplomats taken hostage by radical Iranian students during a takeover of the US Embassy in Iran's capital. The US government was sheltering the Shah, the monarch and dictator of Iran deposed in the Iranian Revolution earlier that year. The students were demanding the Shah's return to Iran to stand trial. Now, if you're wondering why the United States were such good mates with this Shah guy, don't worry, we'll get into that later on. The hostage crisis became the catalyst for harsh economic sanctions to be imposed on Iran by the United States, restricting the importation of various goods from Iran into the US. 
For many American corporations, including The Wonderful Company, this presented a very wonderful opportunity indeed to break into new markets that were previously unviable. Iran remains the largest producer of pistachios, more than doubling the output of the US. If America's relations with Iran were to soften, this would be bad news for capitalists like the Resnicks. So, from their perspective, it makes perfect sense to put some of their fortune toward pushing for conflict with Iran. Isn't that something? We live in a world where wealthy and powerful people are ready and willing to subject millions of people in Iran and around the world to war, torture, death and despair to ruin countless innocent lives just so they could sell a few more of these. It seems unspeakably evil, doesn't it? The kind of calculating malice you'd expect from some kind of comic book villain. But this is fundamentally the logic that drives international imperialism. If there's enough profit to be made in dropping some bombs, starting some wars, or overthrowing some governments, then the ruling class will do it. The value of human life doesn't come into it. It's practically common knowledge that the United States has been involved in the overthrowing of foreign governments. It's one of those things that everyone knows, but nonetheless doesn't seem to come up all that often in polite political conversation. Which is why it came as a bit of a surprise to me when this particular aspect of American foreign policy was highlighted in the Democratic primary debate in South Carolina this year by American Social Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. Barack Obama. Excuse me. Occasionally, it might be good idea to be honest about American foreign policy. And that includes the fact that America has overthrown governments all over the world, in Chile, in Guatemala, in Iran, and when dictatorships, whether it is the Chinese or the Cubans do something good, Hi. you acknowledge that. Hi, Mr. But you don't have trade right. love letters with President them. Biden. The ever faithful and vaguely rodent-like servant of American capitalism, Pete Buttigieg, was, of course, very quick to try and dismiss this. And I am not looking forward to a scenario where it comes down to Donald Trump with his nostalgia for the social order of the 1950s and Bernie Sanders with a nostalgia for the revolutionary politics of the 1960s. <laughs> This is not about what coups were happening in the 1970s or 80s. This is about the future. This is about 2020. Is that so, Mr. Buttigieg? Correct me if I'm wrong, but as I recall, it's only been as recently as November 2019 since the almost certain involvement of the CIA in the lithium-fueled Bolivian coup I brought up way back at the beginning of this video. Mr. Buttigieg would have us believe that at some time around the end of the Cold War, the United States realized how bad it was to prop up coups and overthrow governments, and now, in 2020, we're living in the era of the good guy US, the nice US that respects democracy and national sovereignty and all that good stuff. This is bullshit. The reality is that the United States involvement in the toppling of foreign governments is ongoing, with the Obama administration's role in the 2009 Honduras coup being one of the clearest examples. And as I also brought up earlier in this video, there was the ill-fated attempt by private security firm Silvercore to bring down the Venezuelan Maduro government in May this year, which came weeks after the United States indicted Maduro on charges of narco-terrorism and offered a $15 million reward for information leading to his capture or conviction. Bernie Sanders brings up Chile, Guatemala and Iran as three examples of the United States' involvement in regime change abroad. Since he's been so kind as to put these examples on the table for us, I think it's only fair for me to give a bit of background on each. The assassination by drone strike of the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani earlier this year convinced a lot of us that we were witnessing the beginning of a third world war. Thankfully that didn't come to be, but it would still be a mistake to overlook this event as just a blip on the geopolitical radar. In reality, it comes as another event in a long history of the United States trying to bend Iran to its will. To get some insight on the tensions between the US and Iran that led to the hostage crisis of 79 and more recently Qasem Soleimani's assassination, a good place to start is the US-backed coup that overthrew Iran's existing government and gave birth to the Shah's dictatorship. In 1951, Iran's then Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh nationalised the British Anglo-Iranian oil company, a precursor to the modern BP. At the time, the company held an absolute monopoly on Iranian oil, being the sole oil company operating in the country. 
Two years later in 1953, Mossadegh was ousted as Prime Minister of Iran in a military coup which placed the Shah, or King, in a position of near absolute power. Iran under the Shah went on to reprivatize the country's oil, dividing it up between Britain and the USA, and becoming the premier ally of the Western Bloc in the Middle East hosting military bases which would be used for espionage near the Soviet border. Repression of civilians was rampant, with police brutality, torture and executions being used to wipe out dissent. So, what the fuck happened? Well, the CIA and British MI6 happened. In fact, it was the CIA that spent considerable effort convincing the Shah to go through with a coup in the first place. In the end, their efforts paid off. You could quite accurately say that they made a killing. In Guatemala, it's nearly the same story with different faces. In 1952, the Jacobo Arbenz government implemented a land reform program that distributed acreage from major landowners to landless peasants. The disgruntled owners of much of this land were the American United Fruit Company, now Chiquita Bananas. United Fruit and the Guatemalan government had a bit of a rocky relationship, to put it lightly. In addition to vast swathes of land, United Fruit also controlled the country's telephone and telegraph systems, most of its railways, its Atlantic Harbour, and its banana exports. Arbenz was wary of foreign multinationals maintaining these kinds of monopolies in his country, and so made efforts to directly compete. Among these efforts were a new Atlantic Harbour, highway, and hydroelectric plant. The CIA, acting loyally on United Fruit's behalf, enlisted the help of sections of the military and overthrew Arbenz, although it did take them a couple tries. Juan Carlos Castillo Armas was installed as dictator, and you know how it goes from there. Now, the example of Chile is the most recent one raised by Sanders in this debate, and as such, I'd like to spend a little bit of extra time on it. There also happen to be some important parallels there with the subjugation of Earth by our Combine friends in the Half-Life series. No, believe it or not, I haven't forgotten this is a video about Half-Life. Bear with me, gamers. On the 3rd of November in 1970, a man named Salvador Allende took office as Chile's newest president. Allende's election chilled the bones of the money men and agency spooks of the United States. Not just because Allende was a self-proclaimed Marxist, but because he'd come to power on a wave of mass working class support. He was as much a man of the people as any politician could claim to be. But democracy under capitalism isn't meant to put men of the people in power. It's meant to put representatives of the ruling class in power, and keep them there, and to maintain the illusion that ordinary people have a voice while never giving truth to it. In this instance, in spite of the efforts of the Chilean and American ruling classes alike to sabotage Allende's rise, capitalist democracy had failed to do its job. At the top of this capitalist state now sat a Marxist, and he had a population of organized leftist workers ready and willing to back him up. In terms of policy, Allende was much like the other leaders we've talked about. His main policies were to distribute land among the peasantry, and to nationalize the US-owned copper mines. Perfectly reasonable policies given the his- Ah. Yes, well, that would be the sound of the Chilean presidential palace having the absolute shit bombed out of it in a CIA-backed military coup. Well, who could have seen that coming? Yes, on the 11th of September of 1973, less than three years after Allende's election, all of the meantime being characterized by open class warfare between Chile's ruling class and workers, the ruling class had had enough of all this democracy rubbish and decided to take matters into their own hands. The coup was a culmination of years of conspiracy and economic warfare in Chile, throughout which Chile's native ruling class and the CIA worked hand in hand to try and bring an end to Allende's presidency and secure the future of capitalism in Chile. Allende's years in the presidential palace were years of chaos for everyone in Chile. From the ruling and upper middle classes, there were riots, deliberate slowdowns and stoppages of production and distribution, and hoarding of vital supplies like food and hygiene products. The goal of all this was to cripple the economy and to drive the people of Chile into poverty and hunger, and pin the blame on Allende and his working class supporters. And, of course, it would be later revealed that all of these efforts were generously funded and trained by the CIA. As US President Richard Nixon infamously put it, 
The CIA's task in Chile was to make the economy scream. Chile's workers were not about to take this sitting down though. They responded by taking over the tasks of production and distribution themselves, organizing into cordones or industrial belts, associations of workers who took the tasks of managing the economy and meeting people's needs into their own hands. But Allende was still the president of a capitalist state, and along with that came all the political pressures that that entails. For all his revolutionary rhetoric, he couldn't risk being seen to be supporting illegal sieges of production. The legitimacy of his government had to be upheld. And so, it became the government's task to demobilize the workers and even punish them with police and military repression when they stepped too far out of line. But Allende's attempts to play mediator in the ongoing class war didn't win him the good faith from the right that he'd hoped for. In fact, his enemies interpreted this as weakness and took it as a green light to ramp up their agitations further still. A matter of months after a first ill-fated coup attempt by a single military regiment at the end of June, Chile would have their own 9-11 moment on the 11th of September 1973. In the early morning, bombs rained down from the sky as military troops stormed the Laminator Palace. Rather than allow himself to be captured by the military, Allende reportedly died of a self-inflicted gunshot. Though, if you want to believe Fidel Castro's version of events instead, he actually went out in a blaze of glory wielding a gold-plated AK-47 and wrapped in a Chilean flag. I kind of prefer that version, to be honest. In the following days, the new military government carried out a campaign of terror against the Chilean population. Thousands were executed or disappeared, tens of thousands were imprisoned, and hundreds of thousands more fled the country to avoid a similar fate. People perceived to be supporters of Allende were rounded up, tortured, and executed en masse in football stadiums. Death squads toured the nation's prisons, systematically murdering prisoners deemed to be subversives. The economic policies pushed by the military dictatorship sought to undo the work of Chile's workers in democratizing the country. Industry was privatized and deregulated, social spending was aggressively cut down, and foreign multinationals were again given free reign to have their way with Chile's natural resources. US companies operating in Chile in particular saw their profits increase immensely. The mass killings and imprisonments carried out in Chile over those years represented a genocide of a different kind. A genocide of ideas, of a national culture that celebrated freedom, resistance, and the power of ordinary people working together to change things for the better. As part of his rule, Augusto Pinochet, who became the leader of the military dictatorship, pledged to bring about a moral cleansing of Chile, to leave it purified of vices. It calls to mind the speeches of Dr. Breen on behalf of the Combine in Half-Life 2, broadcast over nearly every monitor and screen in the game, in which he repeatedly asserts the need to combat the human vices of instinct and rebellion, for humanity to adapt to a new hyper-authoritarian power structure, supposedly for its own good. But in the face of this pre-existing liberty-loving culture, the Chilean dictatorship and their North American collaborators understood that killing Allende and terrorizing his supporters alone wouldn't be enough to consolidate the new order. Much like the Combine, Pinochet's government deemed it necessary to inject the Chilean psyche with a new ideology that would justify their authoritarian policies, to brainwash the people into believing that they would be freer and happier in the long run if they just allowed their new benefactors to have their way. That ideology has come to be known as neoliberalism. One of the main architects of this ideology was American economist Milton Friedman, a professor of economics at the University of Chicago who preached that a purer kind of capitalism, without government regulation, public services, or restrictions on international trade, would inevitably lead to increased prosperity for corporations and workers alike. It would only be telling half the truth to say that the military government in Chile were inspired by Friedman's theories. The truth is that almost immediately after Allende's government fell, Friedman and his collaborators were deeply involved in dictating Chile's new economic policy. A handful of US trained economists versed in Friedman's ideas, known as the Chicago Boys after the university in which they were trained, were appointed to many posts as high-ranking economic advisors in the new Pinochet regime. In 1975, Friedman himself would personally meet with Pinochet to discuss economic policy, and tour Chilean universities preaching the wonders of free market economics. In a sense, the Chicago boys were the true dictators of economic policy in the new Chile. 
It's no accident that Chile's new neoliberal economic program immensely benefited US corporations operating on Chilean land, often at the expense of native Chilean companies. Throughout Half-Life 2 and its sequels, the Shulathoi, the Combine's appointed advisors in the dictatorship ruling over Earth, are heavily implied to be the true governors of the policy of the new regime. In some ways, the relationship between Breen and his Combine advisors can be compared to Pinochet's with the Chicago Boys, with each of the dictators participating in the oppression and slaughter of their own people for the benefit of a foreign power. Breen and Pinochet both also see themselves as being at the helm of a kind of holy war against the old culture that dominated their societies, an organized effort to wipe out the human vices of rebellion, solidarity, and yearning for freedom. As Pinochet battled the Marxist cancer that held back Chile from its glorious neoliberal future, so too did Dr. Breen fight against the civilian rebellion that would jeopardize humanity's potential future as a respected component of the Combine Empire. For both these men, the human drive to take control of one's own destiny was a social disease that needed to be wiped out, whether by execution, torture, and fear, or by total control over the media, and by proxy, control over which ideas people would be exposed to, and which ones would be censored out of existence. To segue away from Half-Life for a moment, I think that Allende's 1970s presidency can teach us a few important lessons about the capacity of socialist elected capitalist governments to bring about socialism from above. Even if by some miracle you manage to beat the ruling class in their own game and win government, if they believe the threat to their power is dire enough, they will not hesitate to just flip the board and kill you and everyone else who had the audacity to defy them. The idea that you can dismantle a capitalist system from the top down and have the wealthy and powerful peacefully watch by as you strip away their wealth, power and privileges is ludicrous. They won't care how many elections you've won. The elections exist in the first place to justify their power, not yours. Anyway, I'll end that point there. We'll get back to all that stuff another time. But for now, back to video games. The civilian rebellion in Half-Life 2 is repeatedly likened to an infectious disease by the Overwatch voice, an AI that communicates with and issues orders to combine troops. Medical terminology is used, with incidences of resistance being called infections or outbreaks, and anti-government individuals being classed as malignant. The combined military forces are regularly instructed to treat, cauterize, amputate, stabilize, isolate, or sterilize these infections. The Pinochet government was far from the only real-life authoritarian regime to use this kind of language. Dictatorships the world over were quite fond of using the language of infection and medication to describe dissidents and the actions taken to suppress them. The military dictatorship in Brazil that's now looked upon fondly by current President Jair Bolsonaro, and was also, by the way, helped into power by the CIA, described their horrific regime of torture, disappearances and death squads as a moral rehabilitation. Hey, here's a funny observation I had with regards to all this. Half-Life's G-Man, whose name is an American slang term for an intelligence agent, is said to have personally delivered the alien crystal that caused the Black Mesa disaster in the first place, opening the way for the Combine to take over Earth. It's kind of fun to theorize him as a kind of interdimensional CIA agent, conspiring in support of the Combine invasion to further the interests of whatever interdimensional imperial power he represents. How many other instances of violent regime change across time and space has he had his grubby little hands in? We may never know. But even for all the Combine's takeover of Earth has in common with real-life CIA-backed coups, there are still a few aspects that don't really match up. For one, the Combine didn't mount their seizure of power from within Earth's existing governments, nor as far as we know were they backed up by Earth's existing ruling class. The Combine's takeover began with an all-out invasion and occupation, in which their vastly superior technology and artillery were used to crush any attempt to resist by Earth's established authorities, a much more hands-on approach than the clandestine machinations of the CIA. Rather than seeking to replace one native government with another, the Combine sought to completely wipe away all of Earth's established hierarchies and cultural norms and replace them with their own. 
There's also the point that the Combine's genocide was not just a genocide of ideas as we saw in the likes of Chile, but a bona fide genocide of the human race itself, which it carried out while simultaneously sucking the earth dry of resources to strengthen its own empire. In these ways, the Combine's invasion of Earth resembles a colonization and subsequent genocide not unlike those carried out by real-life colonial empires throughout the centuries, and, as a matter of fact, on the very land on which I'm filming this video. So, yep, we're getting into colonial. Ah, 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 Mr. Cyan Lime. Not so fast. It would seem you've been neglecting to keep an eye on the time. Over half an hour is quite long given your usual rate of progress on these things, and I can't help but notice it has been more than a year now since your last little presentation made its way online. I think it's only right of me to take the liberty of cutting short hmm? this video this time around. N not to worry, though, my dear viewer, I'm sure the rest of what was meant to be this video will be arriving some time in the not-so-distant future. After all, the best things rarely come to us all at once. Just be thankful it's not a part three you're waiting for. What an unlucky situation that would be. Ah, uh, I suppose this is where I'll be getting off now. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I am rather looking forward to this analysis, aren't you? Shut up! <laughs>